Welcome, my name is Harald Sack. And I'm Antan. And this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number five, Ontological Engineering for Smarter Knowledge Graphs. In this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about ontological engineering. And we are going to start with something that you already know. Yes, so let's recall the DIKW pyramid of knowledge management. So at the bottom, we have data, information, and now we're on the knowledge level. In the knowledge level, this is where we enrich the information with semantics. And we do this by means of ontology. So, as already described or defined in the previous lectures, an ontology in computer science is an explicit formal specification of a shared conceptualization. Depending on the level of generality, there are several ontology types and categories. Exactly. So let's start with the top ones. So these are the so-called top-level ontologies, upper ontologies, or foundation ontologies. So they are rather general, and they are cross-domain ontologies. They represent very general concepts, for example, like time, space, event, and they are independent of a specific domain or a specific problem. And then going down to specialization, we have domain ontology. In the domain ontology, we have the fundamental concepts according to a generic domain. And in this ontology, we specialize the terms appropriate for this domain and these terms that were already introduced in the top level ontology. Okay, on the same level, but of course different procedure, we have the so-called task ontologies. This is not about domains, this is about general tasks. So there are fundamental concepts defined according to a general activity or task. So we specialize terms here introduced in the top level ontology regarding the task and how the task is processed. And the most specialized ontology that we have is the application ontology. In this ontology, we specialize um, terms that are in the domain as well as the task ontology. It often uh, specify roles played by domain entities for specific activity. Yeah, so most ontologies you will have to deal with are on the application ontology level because you will not necessarily, let's say, cover an entire domain in its completeness, mm -hmm. but you have a specific purpose in mind. What exactly do you want to do? What task do you want to solve in a specific domain? And then you are at the application level. Yes. Okay. So we are now in the realm of ontological engineering. And the question that we had in the beginning is how to create better ontologies and what kind of activities are involved there. We know that ontologies enable interoperability among metadata. So this is one of the most important tasks. And therefore, we need specific tools and methods, first of all, for the development of ontologies. So we already have talked about different methodologies for ontology design. Furthermore, we need methods for efficient comparison of these ontologies. If I want to decide which is the best ontology for my specific task, I have to I need means for, for evaluation. So we talked about that in the last lecture. And what we are going to do next, of course, then, is to look at combinations of ontologies, which would be ontology alignment. But let's first recall how did the ontology design process work in the end. Okay, we have here in the beginning, let me switch on the laser pointer, you see here uh, a couple of tasks that are all involved with natural language description. Because at the beginning of the ontology, what you do is together with your domain experts, the knowledge engineers are creating a terminology. So they are determining what are the important terms that have to be cited or quoted and processed then for my ontology and they have to be explained, which is a glossary. And you remember that we try to do competency questions. So this is kind of a requirement analysis for the task at hand and which questions should the ontology to be developed be able to answer. Next part would be the formalization part that we have here. So this is mostly the realm of the knowledge engineer because from the terms you have there you create concepts 
So you do conceptualization. For that, you are creating classes and relations. And then you do restrictions on classes and constraints. That's the formalization part. And when you have done that, you should, of course, find your individuals. So the knowledge graph has to be populated. So this is knowledge graph population. And this, of course, is also an interesting task which follows then later on. The most important thing here again is you see here that the arrows go back and forth again. First of all, among these parts, but also between the parts. So overall, this is an iterative process that repeats again and again, because after each step, what you have to do, you have to evaluate. You have to see, does everything fit together? Is there anything where, for example, previous steps have mm. to be improved or changed to get ahead to make a better ontology. So this is a rather, let's say, time-consuming process which might never be finished because reality, which of course reflects to what you have defined in your model, is also constantly changing. So two slides prior we were talking about ontology alignment. But before we can align two or more ontologies, we first have to look at how ontologies differ. So here we have a list of ways in which ontologies can differ. The first one is um, same term describing different concepts. So for example, the term author. It can be the writer of a book or it can be the creator of a document. The second one would be different terms describing the same concept. So for example, depending on a domain, you would have, say, author in the bibliography domain, or you can have writer in the scientific publication domain. The third one is different modeling conventions and paradigms. So an example of this would be uh, how to describe temporal aspects. You can either describe this as an interval where you specify, say, beginning year or end year, or a point in time, specific point in time. And then there are also um, different level of granularities. This has to do with the class hierarchy. So for example, fiction is very general, but there are different types of fiction. There are, for example, political fiction, science fiction, romantic fiction, uh, and every other literary genre under fiction. So level of granularity also differs particularly when you have to talk about tasks. And lastly, or no, not lastly, um, there are more, but uh, for this slide we will only, um, the last item would be different coverage or different points of view. So what we are doing is we are looking at the heterogeneity of ontologies. There are different types of heterogeneity. So for example, the most easiest one would be syntactical heterogeneity. Their ontologies are available in different ontology representation languages. You might represent an ontology in pure RDFS, or you might use any kind of dialect of OWL that is available, including even rules. If they are heterogeneous in terms of different representation languages, this can be resolved purely on the conceptual level, most times preserving the semantics, depending on, of course, the semantic expressivity that is exposed in your ontology. Another type would be terminological heterogeneity, and this mostly refers to naming differences. So when you identify your entities in different ontologies, you might use different names for exactly the same thing, like, for example, you remember author versus writer. And this, of course, occurs because different natural languages might be used there. So not only in the same language, if you have, let's say, an ontology that is described in Italian, another one that is described in German, of course, there is, again, translation necessary, and um, there is a terminological heterogeneity, and it's difficult then to map them to each other. Next would be conceptional. This is semantic heterogeneity, and this concerns ontology models. Uh, they model the same domain but in a different way. And this we also mentioned so far, so you can definitely model the same situation, the same fact, in very different ways, depending on exactly your point of view. And mm, these differences might occur in coverage, in granularity, in perspective. And this, sometimes it's really difficult then to align to ontologies which are different on the conceptual, on the semantic level. 
And then the last one would be semiotic or pragmatic heterogeneity. And this concerns for differences in the interpretation of the domain to be modeled by humans. Because I see, let's say, a specific domain in a complete different way than you are, because my intentions are different. So this is semi um, semiotic heterogeneity. And also, this is a rather difficult task then to align or to map these ontologies with each other. So the question now is, how do we do ontology alignment. So ontology alignment, also known as ontology matching, is the process of determining correspondences between ontological concepts. We take three inputs here. We take the first ontology, O sub 1, and then the second ontology, O sub 2, as well as the input alignment. Together with, with these inputs, we are also aided by two other things. We have the parameters up here, where we can define weights, thresholds, and so on, as well as external resources, such as the thesauri, common knowledge, as well as other rules. We then process the inputs and other external resources. We do the matching, and then we get as output an alignment A, which gives us the set of correspondences between O sub 1 and O sub 2. Okay, so let's formalize exactly that general model of ontology mapping. So given two ontologies, A1 and A2, and then a correspondence or mapping among entities E sub 1 and E sub 2 from O1, respectively from O2, this is defined as the following um, tuple. So you have here first the ID, which is a unique identifier of the correspondence. Then you have here the entities E1 from O1 and E2 from O2. You have a relation R, so this might be, for example, equivalence if these two entities are really equivalent. One might be more general or less general than the other, or they might be completely disjoint. And there are more types of relations, so one might be part of the other and so on. So this is then R. And then, of course, you have to tell us about the confidence of exactly that kind of, of mappings. How sure are you that this mapping really holds? So there is a confidence measure, typically in the range of 0 and 1. And this, of course, holds for the correspondence between these two concepts, entities E1 and E2. So then, this correspondence asserts that the relation R holds between those entities with confidence N. This is how exactly then this mapping reads. Okay, so let's show you some simple correspondences. For in the first line, we see an instance correspondence. We say that DBpedia George Orwell, an individual in DBpedia, is equivalent to the Wikidata Q3335. The second correspondence uh, belong to the class class correspondence. So we say that author is equivalent to writer class. The third correspondence indicates that fiction with a confidence score of 1 is a broader term for science fiction. Meaning it is more general. Yeah, it is more general, yes. And lastly, the property RDFS label is more general with a confidence of 0.9 compared to the Dublin Core DC title property. Of course, we now made up these numbers completely mm -hmm. on our own, and it's difficult then to give, let's say, um, a, a concrete value there that is absolutely true. So this depends on your situation. You might have, let's say, made, tried out on samples, and according to that, then in the end here, this kind of confidence has been uh, computed. Of course, these correspondences can be also much more complex. For example, if you want to let's say, compare speeds in different metric systems. So for example, speed and velocity. So if you have, uh, I guess, the one is uh, kilometers per hour, the other one is, of course, miles per hour or something like that. And then you can speed and velocity, of course, here uh, also compute accordingly between different metric systems. Another one which is also quite complicated is here a logical type of correspondence. I could say here, for example, if x is in book, so this is a rule, and x is the author of y and y is a rate, uh, writer, then 
it follows with a confidence of 85% that x is written by somebody and we have here a first name and the last name. So this is then the name of the writer. Mm -hmm. And this might hold between two different ontologies in most of the cases, as you see here, but there might be also a case when, for example, we don't have a last name or when the name is given in another way so that it doesn't hold at all. Okay, and if you then look at that, so you see here two different ontologies. One, we see a class hierarchy on the left side, another class hierarchy on the right side, and then you see all the correspondences we have tried to, to put in there. And then we say, for example, here in one ontology we have a book, in the other we have a volume, and they are exactly the same. So we can say that these are two book ontologies, so therefore um, we, we, we simply um, give here a confidence value of one. Then we have in one here the ID and in the other one we have the ISBN number and we say yeah they also most likely correspond. We are not so sure there might be IDs that don't con con correspond to, to these ISBN numbers. So therefore it's only a confidence of 90%. Then we have person and we have human in the other. Again they are equivalent with a mm. probability of 90% and we have name and title. So since it's books and we have here a name of a book and this is a title, we also assume, yeah, name might be even a bit broader than just title because name might also, uh, let's say, be taken for, for the name of the author. So therefore it's a broader concept. Also we do have in both of the ontologies, again, we say that's class correspondence uh, and we are 100% sure of it. And then we have science on the one hand side and es uh, essay on the other side, and of course they are related with each other, so science is more specific than just an essay, because an essay also can deal, for example, with politics, and mm -hmm. we are sure about that, around 90%. So now we've just shown you how ontology alignment happens. Now there are automated methods to support ontological engineering, and one of which is called ontology learning, where we learn new ontologies from given set of information resources. So one such uh, source would be raw text. So we learn ontology directly from raw text. So we can do this uh, automatically or semi-automatic, uh, where we learn lightweight ontologies by means of text mining and information extraction. In this kind of ontology learning, we employ natural language processing techniques. The second one is learning ontology from linked data, called linked data mining. And this is where we detect uh, patterns such as class hierarchies, for example, from RDF graphs via statistical methods. This is some kind of empirical knowledge mm. representation yes. we have there. Yeah. Okay, and we continue then. You could also do concept learning in description logics and OWL. What you do there is you learn schema axioms from existing ontologies and instance data mostly based on inductive logic programming. So this is a specific technique that you can use there. Or we do crowdsourcing ontologies. This is also a way, so this combines on the one hand side the speed of computers with the accuracy of humans. So for example, for taxonomy construction via Amazon Turk or via games the purpose. Okay, so if you are going to learn ontologies from text, usually you have to run through a natural language processing pipeline and that might look like this one which is rather general. So you start with unstructured text here and then you do first always a pre-processing. So you have to find out if you have um, floating text, natural language text. So what does each single word mean? So this means mm. you do first as part of speech tagging, you do a parsing and lemmatizing, which are pre-processing techniques. And then you do term and concept extracting. Usually you have to do for that a syntactic analysis. You do categorization or you use so-called subcategorization frames, the use of seed words and so on, and you always have a lexicon there in the background. Also then you do relation extraction and there are many different ways to do that, but of course you have to find out about the terms, what are the entities that are somehow important, and you have to find out what are the relations that have to be put together. And then of course via inductive logic programming you try over all what you have here to extract also axioms to put everything together and in the end this also has to be evaluated to find out 
in. I mean, in the best case, you have a kind of gold standard and stuff like that, or you do a human evaluation to, in the end, create your ontology. But this is, as I said, rather general. There are many different ways. In general, the ontology learning layer cake, so it's of course, um, uh, let's say, uh, a set or layers of uh, increasingly difficult and uh, more specialized and semantics expressive tasks starts on the bottom here with a term extraction. So for example, from a text we could here identify the important terms. So let's say we have here river, country, nation, city, capital. You see this is something that has to do with geography. Of course, we have to find out uh, multilingual synonyms. So if we are dealing, let's say, an ontology that is based on natural language texts in different languages, so then we would have country, nation, land, and stuff like that. Th this could also be friend, nation, or something like that. And then you do a conceptual description of your terms here. So we say C equals country, and then you provide a description of that, and probably you provide also a URI, an identifier for that. If you have your concepts, of course, these concepts are structured somehow. So you need concept hierarchies. We can here, for example, distinguish capital from city and can say capital is something more special than city. Every capital is a city, of course, but not every city is a capital. So therefore, we have here a subclass relation. The same holds for city and inhabited geo-entity, for example. Next. When you have concepts related in hierarchies, you, sh you try to find out how are different concepts related with each other, not by the hierarchy. So for example, there might be a relation flow through when you have a river and a geographic entity, and then the river flows through some geographic entity. And also then among these relations, there might be hierarchies. So for example, you might have the relation capital of, and you might have the relation located in. And then of course, every capital of a land, so this means there is a city and on the other side a land. This is located in some land, so this is of course more special, but not the other way around. Based on your relation hierarchies, then you put axiomatic schemata, for example, stating that specific concepts that you have, they are disjoint, like for example, a river is not a mountain and vice versa, and even then more general axioms that you need then to complete your ontology. The, in, for example, you could say that every country has at most one capital. This is the ontological ontology learning layer cake, and you see, of course, how here the semantic expressivity is growing, and of course, each single task requires then specific methods in the end to create your uh, ontology in an automated or semi-automatic way. Okay, so if you notice, the ontology layer cake also looks analogously to the ontology design workflow. For ontology design workflow, you first start with terms and glossary, but it's from left to right, while your ontology layer is from bottom up, right? So, okay. So now that we have talked about ontology learning, the next step now would be to populate our existing ontologies with individuals from information resources. Mm -hmm. And that would be the topic of the next lecture on knowledge graph construction.